Welcome to Living Faith for Today, and uh, we are delighted you're here to share in the living word of the living God, especially in this time when we anticipate the dawning of a new year. And I would like for us to, today to consider the subject, what's new? What's new? Whenever we take time to reminisce about our lives, we often find ourselves thinking of the past and trying to recapture some of those precious moments of our youth. The past is a kaleidoscope of class reunions, scrapbooks and photo albums, familiar songs and old neighborhoods. Like long-time friends, they awaken our memories and stir dormant emotions. There are promises some met, some broken, and some failed altogether. And the fact is, many of us like to hold on to the pleasant things and often strive to forget memories that are painful by relegating them to the subconscious. However, there is still value in remembering if we see the past as a safeguard that mistakes will not be repeated and commitments made must be fulfilled. And those things done on our behalf must be acknowledged and utilized. And in the scriptures, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 15 through 19, God speaks through the prophet about these very things. He says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, make a dry path through the sea. I call forth the mighty army of Egypt, with all its horses, chariots. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candlestick. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. Why well, I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? Well, the importance of this has never been more clearly seen than in this text as God reminds us of what he has done in the past with a thought. It should give people hope in following him because of who he is. Many people witnessed God's mighty acts on their behalf in the past. And they were also witnesses to his mighty acts in the present. Even though they did not grasp the significance nor fully recognize his presence among them. So in reflecting on this passage, I wondered if this is not a description of many believers today. Well, we are aware that we live in critical times when current events such as a worldwide pandemic, COVID-19, and heightened racial unrest threatens to change our country and our world. And from the scripture, we know that God, who controls history, has spoken to his people in the past and is surely speaking in the present. However, we seem to be confused about what events mean and are hardly conscious of God's personal dealings in our lives. We often feel ourselves being pushed and pulled and find ourselves in situations demanding change in our thinking, in our lives, and in our space. Therefore, what the prophet Isaiah is suggesting is the memory of God's mighty acts is reinforcement to one's present confidence. He recalls the supreme events of Israel's past, namely the deliverance from oppression in Egypt and the highway God made through the Red Sea with destruction of the pursuing Egyptian army. And yet, such a memory is relevant only if it inspires faith 
for our present deliverance. And what we need to learn today is we, in recalling the past, we look back, not to hold on to it, but to find hope in the present. As we reflect on God's promise for his people, I am struck by the notion that God promises to make all things new in greater measure than ever before. Beloved, contrast this with what is being taught in many religious circles today. A number of theologians believe that much of what God did in the past has not been continued because it is no longer needed. And couple this with the fact God's power and gifts that were poured out at Pentecost is seen by many modern theologians as no longer operating in the church today. And this being the case, it appears that the contemporary church needs renewed eyes of faith to see God. For only with eyes of faith is it possible to perceive this new event from God, which is so much greater than the old and so much more wonderful and glorious by comparison. And when one considers the time Isaiah was writing and the result in history since, it becomes clearly understood that this new, more wonderful event has already begun. It commenced some 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ descended from the throne room of God as a divine embryo, broke into our humanity, suffered and died at Calvary, and was raised from death to life on the third day, that you and I might receive mercy, forgiveness, and grace. It's in Jesus that all things become new. And the Apostle Paul confirms in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And when I think of what it means to become new in Christ, I am reminded that the Holy Spirit gives us new life. And we are not the same anymore. The Holy Spirit gives us a new heart and a new mind to recognize and apprehend the things of God. And we are not merely reformed, rehabilitated, re-educated, reprogrammed, or refurbished, but we are regenerated. We have shed the old and put on the new. We are new creations living in vital union with Christ Jesus. You know, I can remember clearly when I first received new birth. But I also recall that several years after the newness had begun to wear off, I had gotten stale. I had become complacent. I was comfortable in my faith. And sin became a frequent visitor in my life with the result the joy I once knew was reduced to an occasional high. The peace I once knew was now simply a lull in the turmoil. The Christ I once knew had been relegated to a seldom seen acquaintance. My faith had resorted to following the traditions and formulas of religion. And before I realized it, I had lost the joy of Jesus. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, the church at Ephesus is admonished by Jesus. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Beloved, 
How many of you have ever been in love? How many of you can remember the blush of your first love, which was termed puppy love? Oh, I hope you never get so old that you can't remember what it was like when you were first smitten with someone of the opposite sex. Oh, I can still remember. While my family was living in New Haven, Connecticut, I went bonkers over a young girl. At 11 years old, I was in love. I used to lie awake at night thinking how wonderful she looked with her reddish hair and enormous freckles. I couldn't eat or sleep. I used to rush to school early to catch a glimpse of her when her father dropped her off. Do you remember the rush of emotion when you saw him or her and how your heart beat so fast you thought it would never stop and how every once in a while it would seem to skip an extra beat? Do you remember how you felt when you first met Jesus? Do you still feel that way about him today? Do you remember the excitement inside and how you thought everybody could tell you were weak in the knees? Can you remember when you were first baptized? Was it something like that, full of emotion on a high, feet not yet touching the ground? And do you know that some people say youth are too young to know what they're doing, that they won't even remember the day they met Jesus. Well, I want to tell you and want to tell them no heart is too young to fall in love with Jesus. No heart is too young to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you ask, how do I know? Well, Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 14, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Beloved, I tell you today, God is indeed doing a new thing among us. And looking back, there was a time when adults used to sit around and plan everything for our youth. And they would say, you've been around a lot longer than you, and we're much older. You're not ready yet to take over. However, I see today that in our children, in many ways, are leading our adults. They bring a new fire to our churches. They bring a new life to worship. They bring a new freshness of the spirit and they embody the gospel in ways we once did. But I can now understand more clearly what Jesus meant by his response to his disciples' question in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to stand among them. And to the astonishment of these men, he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So just as a man and woman fall in love, so also new believers rejoice in a newfound forgiveness and grace but when we lose sight of the seriousness of sin and allow intellect to replace faith, programs to replace divine direction, tradition to replace scripture, and theological suppositions to replace the spirit, then we begin to lose the thrill of our forgiveness, our joy, and our peace and ultimately our love for Christ begins to wane. However, when that happens, God sends an Isaiah to bring to our remembrance 
those early days of love. He reminds us it was he who put food on our table, clothes on our back, and a roof over our head. It was God who made a way out of nowhere, lifted us out of the miry clay, and placed our feet on the rock to stay. It was God to whom the boy's mother pointed to when he asked, Mama, how are we going to make it? And she said, Son, I don't know how, but I know who. It was God who filled me with the joy of my first love. And it was he who said, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And I confess, for a while I had lost the vision, but once I was reminded of what God had done, my eyes of faith began to focus again, and I saw Jesus. I made his acquaintance again. I renewed my first love. I had a new vision of the Savior. I discarded the programs, the creeds, the formulas, and traditions. I laid aside the textbooks and sat at his feet where it first began. And I heard him say, take a fresh look at me. Remember where it started. Remember your foreign, former zeal. And when I looked at Jesus, I fell in love all over again. You know, some of you listening to me today are in bondage. Some of you have wandered away from God. In fact, maybe some have never seen God. Some people are struggling with illness, with family problems, with sin, and are separated from God. And on the surface, you may see no way out of your wilderness, or you may see only the swollen waters of the sea. But God says, I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Beloved, I tell you today, don't look back with a longing for the good old days. Don't talk about your tradition and what you used to do. Do not recall the former things and try to recreate them today, but go to where Jesus is now and let him take you to where you first believed. And if you renew your love with Jesus, paths will be open in your desert. Streams will flow in your dry places. And no matter how bad it seems, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He knows all your needs, and he can be trusted not to fail. And Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Verse 13, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And does the Lord Jesus himself not say in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, Behold, I am making everything new, and these words are faithful and true. And does God not say, forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past, because I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Beloved, that's the question today. God has already started and already done a new thing. Do you perceive 
what he has done for you. Praise him for what he's doing, not for the past, and look forward with hope to the future. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed today. Amen.